for handling public comment. The public comment portion of our meeting is available to members of the public who wish to address any topic. Anyone who would like to speak during public comment must sign in prior to the start of the meeting and list a topic or topics they want to discuss. Each public comment speaker will be allowed a maximum of three minutes to address the board for each topic. If more than 10 speakers are signed up to speak on the same topic, all additional speakers on that item shall be limited to two minutes. However, any public testimony speaker who requires a translator will receive up to six minutes to address the board. Please keep your comments or criticisms civil and courteous. Please avoid using profanity and refrain from making personal attacks on others during your opportunity to speak. Lastly, we ask that you do not discuss students who are not your own children. If a speaker is seeking board resolution of a specific complaint, that concern should be addressed to the district's grievance process. District policy DGBA has been established for addressing employee complaints. Policy FNG is the avenue for filing parent complaints and policy GF addresses community member complaints. Grievance forms may be obtained at any campus administration office or at the district central administration offices. Thank you. Our first speaker tonight is Ms. Mary Maney. Ms. Maney, welcome. Good evening, Mr. President, Superintendent Fedion, and board members. Um, uh, the topic I was interested in talking on tonight was the cyber security incident. A um, couple concerns have been brought to several attentions because of the depth of it was and possible causes of it. Um, I do know that uh, one of the rumors that's going around is part of the reason we had the leak was because when we uh, sold off all the computers, they weren't completely scrubbed. So some information got out that way. Um, but when they were talking about that, I'm going, how would they get my personal information if I didn't have a computer turned in? Uh, there was also in the letter we received something about uh, a little bit of on the ransom. And I know the ran uh, cyber ransom is a big thing going on. And it's a scary, it's a scary thing to have to deal with. The fact that, you know, you guys have been dealing with it for over a month before we were notified, it's a little of concern. I do appreciate the fact that you're putting in a year for the um, threat awareness. Um, that is helpful. But however, since some of the in information that's out there is the children's information, just one year, and it's, and it's already supposedly on the dark web, one year for them is not going to be necessarily sufficient. Um, I work with financial math. I have all my students before they graduate leave my class. They have to pull their credit reports from all three bureaus to check to see they're under 18. They should not have anything out there. They don't own any credit cards. And some of them already have activity out there under their thing. So, you know, trying to keep the kids aware of what they've got coming up and what they may do. This is something that might be nice to have a little bit more communication rather than just kind of an email that isn't really clear and it's kind of waffly. Um, and then what you're hearing from people talking about and then what it says, there, it's kind of a little bit of confusing. So it would be really nice if, you know, we can get, be a little bit more aware of what's going on with that. So that was just basic comment. And otherwise, thank you for, for letting us know and putting the one year out there because I do know that some of the school districts outside of the state that have had experiences of this don't offer that to their, their students as well as their teachers. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Rainey. Our next person is Mr. Adano Seguera. Mr. Seguera. Good evening, y'all. Uh, my name is Adano Seguera, employed by the school district here on my own behalf. I also wanted to comment on the cyber attack. Um, unfortunately, I was one of the affected. Um, as a stakeholder, um, what I wanna hear from the district is assurance that you're doing everything in your power to ameliorate the situation. Um, and uh, I appreciate the, the one year. 
of uh, identity protection. That's nice. Um, but when we're putting out statements, um, especially over the Christmas break, uh, I think it's a little tacky and unprofessional to try to discredit the media or criticize a employee, an employee. So if we could um, take a look over that for future statements, and I'm very much looking forward to this report. Um, the second thing, a long overdue thank you for the mid-year stipend. Um, I know I was very much appreciative of those $500. Um, I asked some people across the district for any words that they wanted to share. So if you don't mind, I'm going to share those with you. So one person said, it feels good for us and for our hard work to be acknowledged. Another person said, I feel appreciated. You know, so many in education are leaving the field entirely, and this makes me want to stay. Of course, uh, from other people, there was comments like, where's the rest of it? <laughs> um, but also people saying, with how many people leaving the field, they would have appreciated a little bit more. Um, and I wanted to close with uh, this one that I found uh, quite touching. As a current teacher that works multiple side jobs and extra duty positions to make ends meet, this Christmas bonus is extremely helpful. I've taken on the role as primary caretaker to my grandma and mother, and while I'm grateful to work in the capacity that I do with the students I service, financial incentives such as these go a long way in helping me provide for my family, buy supplies for my students, and stress a little less about paying my own monthly expenses. Once again, thank you so much for supporting SBCISD staff through incentives such as these. So I hope uh, this is a sign of things to come, of you guys putting uh, employees first. I know it's uh, a tough job. You have lots of numbers to look at. You have to make some tough decisions, but uh, just keep us in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Osegueda. That concludes public comment, Mr. Medrano. Thank you, Mr. Moreno. Item 2.1, Inicios Academy Schools of Choice presentations. Ms. Servion. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Medrano. So this evening, we will be highlighting some of our Inicio schools. Actually, we will be highlighting schools that we already have um, our students uh, in and have already been rolling out their programming. So we're looking at our Fine Arts Academy we're looking at our Environmental Science Academy and also at our STEAM Academy that are going to walk us through what goes on day in and day out at, uh, at Downs Elementary to begin with. Uh, Dr. McGee, did you want to add something to it? Good evening, um, President Moreno, uh, Board of Trustees, um, Superintendent Servion. I'm uh, so excited to present our Schools of Choice, Anicio Academies, um, our existing schools. They've done the hard work, as you know, in 2019. Um, they were um, uh, implemented, and they've been doing such a great job. And we wanted to highlight them as we move into our expo, which is happening this Thursday. And just so our families and the community can see what choice means and what it means to reimagine school choice. And so without further ado, we have, you're going first? Okay, Sullivan Environmental Science Academy. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Moreno, board president, Mr. Moreno, school board, good evening, Ms. Servion, superintendent, good evening to all of you. I thank you all for allowing us to be here today. We do have some information to share with you. Uh, basically, it's the status of our schools of choice, okay? I am Mrs. Atkinson, as those of you know, Deanna Atkinson, principal at Sullivan Environmental Science Academy. Okay, so I wanna start by just sharing a little bit of our demographics with you guys. And so, hold on, I'm going first too fast. Can you go back? No, it's not going backwards. There we go. 
<laughs> I'm not going clicker crazy, I promise. I'm gonna go back one. Yeah, that would probably be best. Just leave me a demographics, guys. Yeah. I just wanna run by demographics with y'all really quickly. Our current enrollment for this school year, we are at 341 students. Of those students, we do serve some students that are uh, dyslex with dyslexia services. We also have uh, 24 students that we are servicing via GT, pro uh, GT enrichment. We also have uh, four students that are being serviced through Section 504, as well as 57 who are our special ed population. Um, we are also currently servicing 42 bilingual identified students for a total of, we do have 341 students. Um, I do want to share with you just really quickly our vision and our mission. Is, this is something that was established back in 2019 when we first transitioned into our academy. Um, it's something that was created collectively with the staff as well as a few parents that were on our committee. Um, our mission at CESA is to provide students with transformational learning experiences that foster college, career, and military readiness, as well as environmental stewardship. So we just want to make certain that we are making students aware of the impact that they could possibly have in, on, with our environment. Um, our vision at CESA is to be the gold standard in all areas of public education, as is San Nido CISDs, while setting the green standard in environmental science education. So we do want to set that green standard for environmental education as well. Um, we do have some core values, and again, this is something that we met with our staff early on. We had this discussion. We involve students. We involve parents. Um, we have a very active parent center, and they were very vital in a lot of these uh, decisions that we did make. But basically, we had conversations about those things that we felt that we held ourselves true to, and we developed some core values. And so some of the things that we talked about was compassion. We wanted to teach our kiddos, our staff, all of us to just learn to be compassionate towards each other, towards all living things. We also talked about accountability, making certain that our students understand, understood the importance of accountability. Also respect. And then, of course, environmental stewardship, since we are an environmental science academy. And then also making certain that we were um, prepared to provide any kind of service, whether it was at home, in our community, at our school. And so we talked about those things. We came together with our hashtag, which is what we call, and so our hashtag is CESA Cares. We do have a Sullivan Pledge that we do recite every morning, and again, that was worked on collectively with some of our staff. Our students do recite it every morning after the U.S. and Texas pledges. So our motto, everyone has a motto, ours is every day is Earth Day at CESA. And so, you know, we do everything that we can to make our world a better place, not only on Earth Day, but we do that every day. So I do want to talk to you guys just a little bit about, and I think if we move to the next slide. Um, historically, we have traditionally been right around 400. After COVID, we did start to lose some students. Um, we lost some 2021. We had a bigger decrease in 22. However, moving into 2023, one of the bigger gaps that I noted was that we had a big group of fifth graders. We had 67 fifth graders at the end of last year that left us, and we've only been able to recapture 34 pre-kindergarten students. So if you do the math, typically that's, that's the difference there. Um, I do feel that we need to do what we can to try to recruit some of our little ones because I know that they're in our area. We've got a head start right in our area as well that I know kiddos are there. I'm just not sure where they're going. So we probably need to do some tracking to see where those kids are going to see if we can recapture. Um, historically, we've been at three teachers per uh, kindergarten and this year we're, we're at two. And so if we can at least get back to three, I think that would make us our, our enrollment just a little bit stronger. So some of the school-wide features that we do, we have lots of initiatives that we have going on, but these are the ones that we are the most true to. Um, we are huge with recycling. We have a collaboration with Pepsi Recycling, uh, with PepsiCo, and so we are currently fifth in the nation. They have like a running tag, and so our kiddos are real good about bringing stuff from home. They do bring it from home. They use it. They fill our bills, uh, the bins that we do have out there. Um, they log the pounds and so pepsico has a really good system where they say okay for every bag of plastic it's you know so and so points and for every bag of paper it's so and so points and so the kids are real good about going in entering so while they're doing that they're learning math they're learning responsibility a lot of really good skills go into that as well so our recycling club is is a really big one on campus. We also have our water and light conservation, so kids will go around the campus and they'll be like, miss, I saw this classroom and the Epson projector was still on and there was nobody in the classroom. So, you know, trying to hold the kids, the, the kids hold the teachers accountable for that as well. Um, we do have our arrow gardens in every classroom, and if you guys have not seen those, they're really neat. They're, um, it's basically like hydroponics, so basically you're, you're growing 
plants without the use of soil. And so we do have those in every classroom. We also have garden beds throughout the, uh, the campus. Uh, either grade levels or classrooms do adopt different garden beds, and it's up to them what they want to plant. Some of them choose to do flowering plants, others decide to, uh, to decide to do fruits and veggies. So it really depends. Uh, we also have two greenhouses on campus that we use. What we do is we stock those greenhouses up, and as the plants start growing, the kids begin to propagate. So they'll clip a little piece, and they'll go get a small, little, tiny pot. They'll plant, and the next thing you know, boom, like they have a, a big, beautiful flowering plant coming up. So it's been really, really amazing to see. We've seen the kids do, it's gonna sound weird, but like manual reproduction where they actually get two plants together and they uh, make up like hybrids. It's been super neat, so it's a whole lot of fun. We have some teachers that are super, super passionate about planting and, and doing stuff like that, so that's been a whole lot of fun. Um, we also do water harvesting, so we don't waste a lot of water. What we do is we have the large water cisterns, we collect the water, we use that same water to either uh, water our school pets or we use that for watering the garden as well. And then we do have some school pits on campus. I'm certain most of you have met our Crispy, who started off this tiny and it's now super, super big. So that's a lot of fun. Um, we have chickens, we have ducks, we do have uh, rabbits, we have tree frogs, we have several class pets. So that's a whole lot of fun. We've got our environmental science lab that hosts a whole bunch of those animals as well. Um, as far as clubs, we have several, but these are the ones that we really want to talk about. We have our 4-H club, which is huge. They're really big with the Rio Grande Valley Livestock Show. So we have kids that compete in um, Art, we have kids that compete in photography, we have kids that are competing in horticulture, so they're raising and growing plants from their own. They do a lot of um, combination plants, and so they raise those, they take them on to, uh, to the Rio Grande Valley Livestock Show, so that's a great experience for kiddos as well. Our gardening club is fantastic. We've got kids that submit really, really great photography, really awesome pictures to Rio Grande Valley Livestock Show as well. And so our photography club does really good. Um, we've got a chess club, we've got choir, we have got the coolest little cookers. So we have our, we call them our junior master, our junior master chefs. And so they are not afraid to whip up meals. And so they have made us calabaza con pollo, calabaza that does come from our garden. Um, they've made us the coolest salsa with some veggies that we have in the garden as well. Um, recently, that group of kiddos in particular that are in that picture there are our stingray chefs. They competed in Falfurias at the state level. And so they did really, really well. We had another group, our V squad, who came out second. So our kids are really good. They love to cook. They love, um, they love feeding. For Thanksgiving, we had our, our kiddos also prepare a dish for our staff. So that was really, really nice because they got themselves dressed up. They got their, you know, their meal prepared, and they came and actually served the staff for Thanksgiving. So that was really cute. So just some of the things we do, those are just you know, the ones I wanted to highlight today. I want to talk to you all really quickly, and I'm going to try to talk fast because I know we want to get through this quick. But uh, we do have units of study for every grade level. I'm, I'm certain those of you that have heard about it are familiar with the, pro with the process. And so we start off with pre-kinder. What we do with our pre-kindergarten kiddos is we instill a love of nature. So for them, it's all about, you want to go to the next slide real quick? So for them, it's all about um, taking nature walks. It's all about, you know, having their little magnifying glasses and looking for insects. And they're just basically not being afraid to get their hands dirty. And so that's, that's a whole lot of fun. There are some examples of them planting a tree on Arbor Day. Um, those are, they call themselves the junior rangers. They love exploring nature. So just, we've got a beautiful pond out there that they love to just kind of look and, and explore and look at the different types of things that, they, that we have living and non-living around the pond. Our kindergartners are all about petrology. So they are learning about rocks. Um, I was able to tie in the teaks that are, are covered in the grade level. So those are the teaks that we do cover. Um, they just learn the different shapes, styles, textures, the different types of rocks, all of that. Um, our first graders are all about zoology. So, you know, for them, of course, the big field trip is always taking them to the, to the zoo so that they can get to see the different animals and, and whatnot. But um, for them, it's organisms and environment. There's a connection for the teaks as well. And they just do a whole lot of life cycles. Um, we also focus with them on our, in our chicken coop because part of it is in their teaks. Um, I believe it's 1.10D that talks about um, the life cycle of the chicken. So we make certain that the kids understand that as well. Um, moving on to second grade, our second graders are all about astronomy and weather. So they learn about the planets, they learn about, um, they, they do different models, um, they learn about weather, types of weather, what causes weather to happen. And so um, it's all about hands-on experiences and then creating projects that are based on those units of study. Our third graders are all about the ocean. Um, there's a picture of a beach cleanup that we did because they also have to understand the importance of, you know, taking care of our beaches as well. So that was part of their service project. They also did, uh, they study the layers of the ocean. 
And so they did a really cool hands-on project on the different uh, layers of the ocean. So those are our third graders. Our fourth graders are all about agriculture and forestry. They're the ones that take care of all of our garden beds. They're the ones that do the majority <clears throat> of the competitions that we do in 4-H, just because it takes us, takes us a little while to you know, prepare them for a competition. Um, and then, of course, our fifth graders are all about ecology. Fifth grade is, you know, we do have our standalone science test, so we need to make certain that our kids are fully prepared. Again, the connection to the TEKS. Uh, we do also have a, a collaboration with Texas Wildlife Foundation, and so we do <clears throat> several of their hands-on lessons. So we do visit their, uh, their, they have some wetlands over in Port Mansfield. The kids get to go do a lot of hands-on learning there as well. And um, yeah, it's just really neat. Our goal is always gonna be to make certain that our kids leave our campus experts in all those different areas of study that we've established. Um, we do shoot for two big projects, two in the fall, two in the spring, that we can get done uh, based on these units of study. And then, again, plant a tree today. It's every day, every day, it's Earth Day at Sessa. So, you know, these are some of our fourth graders on Texas Arbor Day, which was November 4th. We did have every single fourth grader take home one of those mulberry trees. Um, like I told you all earlier, we have teachers that are so, so passionate about this, and so they go above and beyond, and they start these mulberry seeds from, I mean, they start the trees from tiny little seeds, and this is what they end up with. They take them home, they plant them, it's super neat. Last year, we also had a group of kiddos that got avocado seeds, put them in Ziploc baggies with a little bit of brown paper. I'm sure you all have done that before, stuck them in their desks until they started growing roots. Once they started to grow roots, they planted them. Super, super awesome. These kids take them home and kids will bring you pictures. They're like, miss, look at my tree, my tree's growing. So just the pride it, it you know, puts in them has been really, really awesome. And then the last slide I have is just, that's our enrollment banner. If you saw us at the parade on uh, Christmas, this was what we did have, we do invite. This is our way of trying to get people to say, hey, you know, this is who we are, this is what sets us apart because we are a little different than your traditional elementary school. I want to I want to congratulate you, Miss Atkinson, and Thank your you. staff for all Thank that you. you do for our students. I appreciate and that. And this is an awesome uh, program. Mm -hmm. And I want to go tour. I haven't toured uh, Sullivan, so maybe we can take a tour over there. Yes. And we need to promote this school even more. I agree with you, 100%. Yeah. Yes, you are more than welcome. Come on by. We do have lots of really, really awesome things. I know a few of you have come by. A few of you have seen our our areas and. You know, we're, it's, it's a lot of fun. The kiddos do love it. So, you know, my thing is we just need kiddos. We, we, we're doing what we can to try and get some better enrollment. Any questions? Anyone? Anything? Questions? questions. No, I, just have a, I, I just have a comment. I've been there, you know, a few times. Ms. Atkinson, I've seen it from the, from the, from the get-go, and it, it's really heartwarming to go in there and see all the kids having a good time and see how that school has transitioned from where it was before to yes. where it's now. So it's a testament to, you know, to all the... Uh, you know, all of you all mm -hmm. that are here and, and on a daily basis and continue to, to do what's, what's best for our kids and continue to provide those resources that they need. And, uh, that. and we'll continue to do that. But I think here, I, I think this is a good testament about our school system, you know, what we can offer our kids. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great for our community to see, you know, the intricacies of what it takes to, to, to be successful and then also to compete against our neighboring schools. Yes. You know, so uh, you're doing a tremendous job along Thank with you. a lot of other staff members here as well. I mean, this is just well, one of those things that we can offer our kids and, 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 and set us apart from, from other districts around us. But once again, congratulations. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank, okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Mr. Monreal from our uh, Dr. Raul uh, Garza Jr. STEAM Academy. So just so uh, everybody understands here on the dais and also out um, in the public, we have been working really hard to have our pamphlets, our presentations ready as our parents go out into our schools and so they can understand everything that is happening day in and day out. And so we wanna make sure that we make that shift where we highlight not only where we've been, what we're doing now and where we're going. And so that's what's really important, the trajectory into 23-24 and enrolling for the upcoming school year. And with that being said, it's been a lot of work and it's been labor intensive and it's been very um, thought provoking for what we've come up with for you here today and for our parents and our community, most importantly. So Mr. Monreal, if you'll walk us through the STEAM Academy. Uh, yes, yes, thank you, thank you so much. Good evening, Board President Moreno, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Cervellon. So uh, the, our presentation is for STEAM Academy, and so we're highlighting some of the things that we do each and every day at our campus. Um, here we go. 
So of course, uh, in, embedded in our uh, master schedule, we have 30 minutes of STEAM each and every day, and we do focus on a different aspect day. So Mondays it's science, Tuesdays it's technology, Wednesdays it's engineering, then arts, then mathematics. So that's something that's embedded. Of course, our teachers always go above and beyond what is required because they, they have that passion for, for, for our STEAM uh, students. Some of our demographics, and so our leadership, it's, I have an assistant principal, Ms. Miranda, our counselor, and myself. Our demographics, we have 455 students. I know it's been a little bit of a decline in what uh, STEAM had initially. And 82% are economically disadvantaged, 45% at risk, 23% early emerging bilinguals, and 19% of our population is in the special ed department. Our mission at STEAM Academy, we want to create a positive nurturing environment, but also with the very rigor, rigorous curriculum. That's part of our mission, and our vision is obviously we want to make sure that these kiddos, we pique their creativity, their interest in each and every aspect that, that of the things we offer at our campus. <clears throat> Did I put that really bad on this clicker? No, it stopped. Oh, now it's going. <laughs> Maybe it's not gonna do. Thank you, sir. Our core values, all our rockets, we wanna make sure that they're responsible, they're organized, we pique their curiosity, they're knowledgeable, they love to explore, they see the value in teamwork, and also their skillfulness to expand. All our curriculum has a STEAM bed em embedded in it, and if you can click on the next slide, these are just some of the projects that our kiddos do for science. We wanna teach them the knowledge of how and why things function as they're creating their projects. If you follow us on our uh, platforms, Facebook, a lot of things that are happening each and every day we spotlight. We've had students that uh, parents have called, my son or daughters have been working on this project, how come you haven't featured it? But we have a lot of pictures each and every day, so we do get a lot of feedback. Uh, positive feedback from our parents uh, showcasing their students. For technology, building essential 21st century skills, we did purchase a coding software over the summer. So this coding software is uh, web-based. It's uh, Robotify, so we do start with first grade, but these kiddos can continue to work on it from home. And the more they work on it, the more banners or medals or levels that they peak. So it's not just restricted to the classroom because it is web-based. For engineering, exploring, and developing concepts, we do have an engineering lab, and we also have a robotics club, and we're slowly bringing back the Green Goblin, or I call it the Green Goblin, but it's actually a, a goblin, a green-powered vehicle that can be uh, used in competitiveness with other schools. Um, and so through ASP, we have somebody that's uh, on board and helping us with uh, expanding the robotics and the engineering concepts. For arts, we do have different uh, Platforms for art and music. We do have an exploration room for with instruments, and also our art teacher does teach different techniques and platforms uh, for mathematics. Of course, the real world problem solving. Each and every day, you walk into a classroom at STEAM Academy, you'll see our teachers use real life examples as they make the connections to the teaks for uh, the lessons of the of, of the day. This is our curriculum for next year. And so if you look at the STEAM-related programming, our pre-K and kinder are project-based, but we slowly increase and gradually increase at, according to the level of the students. We have coding starting in first grade, like I mentioned. We have the engineering as elementary curriculum as well. And then we start with robotics in third, fourth, and fifth grade uh, to increase the rigor of the curriculum. We also wanna make sure we educate the full child so our social emotional learning is a big, big part of our uh, everyday operations at Dr. Garza. It's a very unique culture. We do nurture our students and staff. We, we, we are very blessed to be there with them and we wanna make sure we make those connections with, with our students and staff. Some of the special programs, like I mentioned, we do have a robotics club, we do have the, our engineering lab, we do have coding and then folklorico as well. If you've seen our kiddos perform, they're very passionate about what they do, and uh, they, did, uh, they do love performing for, for, for an audience. Some of the parent perspectives, I have a couple of pictures of our parents, and I like to read what some of them had to say. Ms. Moreno, uh, she said, Escogí STEAM porque se fue de lo tradicional a lo innovador, recalcándose en las materias de sus siglas, asimismo permitiendo que los alumnos desarrollen sus necesidades. Ms. Moreno is one of our uh, PTO, uh, board members, and, and so she's very active in, in, at our campus. We see her 
um, very regularly. Ms. Hubbard said it offers a broad variety of activities to maintain student engagement. Children are having fun, not realizing that they are learning. And Ms. Montelongo, STEAM has become more like a family. They are interested in the child as a whole, whether it's academics, behavior, or social needs, she, including herself. She's been recruiting on her behalf. She goes, I got my sister to bring her kids, and I've told so-and-so to also to come. And so um, she said she was gonna bring them to our showcase on Thursday to see some of those activities that we're, we're doing. From our students, you can see our, our kiddos there. They, they're, they're very active, they love to participate. And again, they, they're learning, having fun at the same time. And uh, you, know, you, you can see some of those comments that they say uh, themselves. Some of the accomplishments at STEAM in 2019, we have the National Institute for STEAM Education. Uh, we, we have that recognition, that means that our staff is, is certified to be STEAM teachers. And also this year, we earned our five distinctions uh, and we're very proud of that, and that's something that we do showcase each and every day. So we do invite you to come to our uh, showcase. If you can pop in, we'll be there, and we'll gladly have, give you a tour and have you participate in some of our STEAM-related activities that we've prepared for you. Good idea, Mr. Morel. I want to yes. congratulate you and your staff for what you're doing for the students. This is a, a school that I also need to tour, as to be nice, and we need to promote it more. And Thank congratulations you. to you and your staff. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Giralde with our Ed Downs Fine Arts Academy. Thank you, sir. Good evening, School Board President Moreno, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Mrs. Servillon. Uh, my name is Alan Laralde. I am the proud principal of Ed Downs Fine Arts Academy. I'd like to start by acknowledging our very supportive, as you can see, and wonderful staff, teachers and staff. Thank you, teachers. I want to start there because, um, as we all know, they are in the classroom, and that's where the magic happens. So thank you guys, I really do appreciate it. So Ed Downs became a school of choice in 2018. At that time, we envisioned a place where students could really, where we could really foster students' love for education, but more than anything, their creativity, their problem solving, and their self-expression. And it's through the fine arts that we accomplished this. Today, my goal is to guide you through what we have to offer here at Ed Downs, and more importantly, to highlight our fine arts program. So as our motto goes, every child is an artist. Some quick facts. I don't have my demographics up here, but I'm a true believer, as I remember being in the classroom, that the teachers with the biggest classrooms with the most enrollment were the teachers that got the most parent requests. And the reason they got parent requests was because they knew those were good teachers. And I see that in schools. I see it everywhere. And so at Ed Downs, I don't have my demographics up there, but I can tell you that compared to last year at this time, we have gained about 20 students. So we're currently at approximately 374 students. So kudos to you guys because I know, and as you guys know being here from San Benito, that Ed Downs has always been one of the jewels here in our town. So, sorry, it's a little sensitive. You weren't kidding, okay? <laughs> um, with, the, with me tonight, our assistant principal, Mrs. Ashley Camacho Garza, and our counselor, Mrs. Priscilla Guajardo, does make up, also part of our leadership team. Our mission at Ed Downs is that we seek to be an exemplary learning establishment that provides, its, that provides itself in, con in contributing to the foundation of our community through encouraging, empowering, and engaging students to reach their highest potential in the area of fine arts, while also challenging our students to be lifelong learners with the tools necessary for success in a changing world. 
Our vision is a diverse and inclusive school community committed to academic excellence and integrity while providing personalized instruction and nurturing the artistic and expressive student. Our core values are positive attitude, respect, integrity, dedication, and expectations of excellence. And this is something that we really push at our school. Every single morning when we do our morning announcements, I remind students that we have very high academic, but also behavioral expectations of them. Our model, an art-infused school, where excellence is not an option, but again, an expectation. Now, um, I am gonna go into our art curriculum next. The way it was done is that we were embedding it in all of our academics. So if you were learning math, for example, you weren't just paper, pencil, or taking a test, but you had the opportunity to draw a model, or better, better yet, maybe create a 3D model, and all of a sudden, students who were not able to show you that they could, they could understand that mathematical concept, all of a sudden had that world opened up to them. But we wanted to make sure that we also, so that's the way it was traditionally done here at Ed Downs, including all of our programs uh, and showcases, but we also wanted to make sure that we, like, raised the bar some, and so we met as a team, we met as a school, and discussed options, and what we decided to do was make art part of the curriculum so that Mrs. Whittemore, who by the way, big shout out to Mrs. Whittemore, she is our arts program right there, uh, so that Mrs. Whittemore wasn't the only one doing all of the art, right, and all the weight on her, and so every single, so this is what we created, and this is what we're gonna talk about next. Uh, we do have every student that goes through our program, does have six art, uh, will learn six disciplines in a six weeks, uh, six, six weeks period. So every six weeks, a student will rotate and learn something new, okay? There are two big annual showcases at the end of each semester, and at the end of every six weeks, students also have the opportunity to showcase what they've created, whether it's visual art or a performance, let's say a dance recital. Uh, let me share the six are painting, dance, poetry. So, uh, and so let me just give you an example about the product. So if you're a kindergarten doing painting, at the end of the six weeks, you will have an art gallery to present to your parents if they come for an open house or something like that. Those are gonna be done in-house so that we'll present them in the library to the rest of our uh, students and staff. But at the end of the, that semester, we do have a big showcase where our parents are going to be invited and they'll be able to see their children's art. And if, let's say, they put together a dance performance, it would be a recital. If it was poetry, it'd be a poetry cafe. But every single one of these art genres is accompanied by a product. Okay, the other three are music, digital art, and theater. And so by the end of the year, every child will have experienced and learned each one of these genres and also produced something because, again, a big part of our vision is that we are instilling creativity in our students, and so they have to create, and they do, and they enjoy it. Uh, here's an example of our winter showcase where our students uh, per, uh, had the performance for their parents. Uh, Mrs. Servion actually was our conductor for this one performance, so she did a great job. Right, Ms. Whittemore, according to Ms. Whittemore. I didn't know. I gave it a shot, but I think do, I messed do, it up do, because do you I have didn't a video on it? Do you have a video on it? We do have the video. This is just a, a short skip in here. <laughs> Happy to share it. Thank you. Our special programs, in addition to, again, having the arts permeated in our, in our, our curriculum, is that we do offer cheer, choir, a full orchestra with all the instruments, and dance. Uh, parent perspective, uh, parents and teachers work together to contribute to a wonderful school experience that are rewarding, but more importantly, helpful to the students of our school. Ed Downs Fine Arts Academy showcases student talents regularly. We do have these events uh, like the 9-11 commemoration ceremony, police night out, Veterans Day program, and of course, our biannual uh, showcases. Uh, at Ed Downs, students Learning is enhanced by integrating the arts and academia. All students are given the opportunity to think critically and approach problem solving from a unique perspective. 
And we'll conclude with our accomplishments. We are a B-rated campus at the moment. We are striving and working very diligently to be an A campus. Uh, last year, UIL, for the district, we are, and still are, the district champions. Uh, we did take uh, awards in chess, music memory, storytelling, ready writing, oral reading, spelling, art, and number sense. Um, that concludes my presentation for today. Thank you, guys. Uh, please enroll at Ed Downs. <laughs> <laughs> hats, off, hats off to your grape up te uh, teachers that are present. Grape ups, good job. Yeah, great, great job. So our new academies have a great foundation to help support them, um, our Collegiate Academy and our Global Leadership Academy. And so we're excited to have these three academies showcase for you as a guide. Um, but, you know, also we're going to do it alone. I have to give a shout out to Ms. Uh, Delia Cornett, our um, Director of Instructional, uh, <coughs> Elementary Instructional Implementation. <laughs> because she's been very instrumental in helping support our teams. And then for those wonderful graphics and videos that you've seen, I want to shout out Mrs. Gonzalez and her communications and PR team for helping us spread the message about our wonderful um, Anicio Academies and the work that they're doing. Do you have any questions for us? Do you want to give them a little bit of a teaser on the artificial intelligence coming in? <laughs> Look at her. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> Just a little bit. So if you haven't heard, I, I do encourage you to check out a little project called ChatGPT. If you've heard of it, it is actually in the process of transforming education. It is an artificial intelligence where you chat GPT. Chat GPT. So let's say you want to ask it a question like, can you write me an essay um, from, about the American Revolution from the perspective of a 10-year-old? It will do it. If you say, can you solve this problem for me? It will do it. And so now there's been this great, New York City schools has already banned it. People are finding ways. Anyway, artificial intelligence. That's, there's, the, there's also the promise of artificial intelligence. It's already in our classrooms. It's helping grade our papers. It's helping provide efficiency to things such as um, plagiarism, checking for plagiarism with software, variety of options. So that being said, um, I've been studying artificial intelligence for a number of years, and I um, was excited to be invited to be a part of a fellowship that is going to be working with artificial intelligence in education as it's growing with the World Worldwide Organization called EdSafe AI Alliance. And as a part of that, um, my goal is to develop a elementary AI program for the district. And so I'm excited to bring this innovative, first of the kind, you're not seeing it anywhere else in the Valley. And to be a representative of San Benito um, is exciting to me. And I'm happy that they chose me, but they also chose this district because I had to outline, you know, what the district was about and what we could do as a team. So I appreciate your efforts and I look forward to working with everyone uh, to bring this to fruition and bring our plans to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McGee. Item 2.2, report uh, on cybersecurity incident, Ms. Sevillon. Yes, so uh, tonight we're gonna have Ms. Benya come forward. We do have a PowerPoint presentation and information for you regarding the cybersecurity incident that was experienced at our district. Also online, we have uh, Lynn Sessions who's been helping us through the process. And I think Allison Clark is online as well. So with that being said, um, Ms. Benya will be leading the presentation, but um, Allison and Lynn will be jumping in to provide clarity. So thank you all for being here. Good evening, President Moreno, Superintendent Mr. Bellon, members of the board, community, and for our um, individuals video conferencing in. I'm gonna go over um, overview of what transpired during the cybersecurity incident, what the district did to respond, 
and what we've done as far as technology side. And I'm also gonna go over some of the frequently asked questions that I've been getting from some of the community members that have reached out to us. On November 1st, we received notification from TEA through Region 1 that San Benito CISD was um, hacked by cyber criminals. They had allegedly gained unauthorized access to our district network, our district servers. Based on our name, the, the district's name being listed on the uh, cyber criminals uh, website. Let's stop right here. Lynn, do you all want to introduce yourselves so that they know who you represent and yes. Allison as well? Be happy to do that. So uh, good evening everyone at Lynn Sessions. I am an attorney uh, in the Houston office of Baker Hotstetler. Um, we work with school districts and other educational institutions all over the state, really all over the country, um, and helping them through cybersecurity incidents such as what Ms. Pena is about to describe uh, to everyone present. I'm joined by Allison Clark, who is in our Dallas office, um, and she has been working very, very closely with the district since uh, we were contacted in early November. And, um, and I want to commend the district on their very um, thorough and quick response to this incident uh, when it was brought to their attention uh, and really commend the transparency in which they have been communicating with um, various agencies within the state of Texas as well as with the community. So the next slides I'll uh, be presenting, please be advised that the steps outlined in the presentation are not linear. Some of them happen concurrently, but because of the presentation purposes, I have to present them in separately in slides. So it, once we found out that um, where we would receive notification, we immediately initiated its, um, the incident response plan and engaged outside cybersecurity experts. The external cybersecurity experts engaged included Privacy Council, which is Ms. Sessions along with Ms. Clark, digital forensics and incidents response service providers, from the district staff, we engaged and notified the superintendent, district's legal counsel, the technology staff, public relations, finance, human resources, PIMS, and San Benito CISD Police Department. Other agencies notified throughout the incident included DIR, the Department of Information Resources, TEA, Texas Education Agency, San Benito CISD Police Department, the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, the U.S. Secret Service, and the Texas Attorney General. Even though we were notified in November 1st, the district was not aware at that time of any specific individuals that, whose information might have been involved, and for that reason, the disclosure was not made at that time. In order to make legally compliant disclosure, Texas law provides that a public entity must be able to identify the persons involved. The professionals that the district involved in the matter advised SBCISD to make full and complete disclosure after identifying exactly whose information was involved and whose information was not involved. The district was advised not to make a blanket statement because one, the district did not want to alarm persons whose information was not involved, and two, if the district had disclosed the situation before confirming that the cyber criminals did not have control of its system, then the cyber criminals could have sought to lock the district out of its own systems. So that means we could have been held um, at ransom and or our systems could have been locked if we would have made that announcement. Once we engaged the entities and um, the external cybersecurity experts, the investigation was conducted between November 4th and December 16th. And it was determined again that an authorized party gained access to the district's network and took certain files from the district servers. The unauthorized criminals intermittently accessed our network between April 8th and October 10th. And that was determined throughout the investigation because of the investigation. During the investigation, our technology department conducted a thorough and exhaustive review uh, to determine if personal information was in the files, identify each individual information to specific to each individual as well as their contact information. Texas defines personal information as a person's first name or first initial and last name in combination with one or more of the following. The social security number, 
requires the full social security number, driver's license or government issued identification number, account number or credit debit card number in combination with means to access the account, for example, security code, access code, or the password. Information that identifies an individual and relates to the physical or mental health or condition of the individual, the provision of health care to the individual, or payment for the provision of health care to the individual. So those were the data elements that we used to search all of those uh, files that were exfiltrated from our network. After conducting the review of the involved files, the district began mailing notification letters directly to individuals whose personal information was identified within those files. On December 30th of 2022, a total of 21,650 letters were mailed to the last known addresses of the involved individuals, of which 12,080 were minors. The notice mail provided information in both English and Spanish and explained how the incident happened the measures the district has taken and details of the information found in the files during the data review. It also outlined additional steps <coughs> that individuals may consider taking in response to the incident. Cybersecurity incident support resources. The notice letters provided a dedicated helpline. The telephone number to a dedicated helpline where individuals could call and ask questions about the incident. It also provided information about the services that were being provided for minors if the individual was a minor and an adult if the individual was an adult. It also provided information on how to reach Experian if the individual believed there was fraudulent use of their information and if they wanted to discuss how they could be able to resolve those issues since the services did provide identity restoration. It also provided information on whom to reach here within the district so that we could answer questions specifically. We also had uh, parents come by and we walked them through on how to enroll their children in the services. Additional steps taken to secure the network. Security measures taken by technology included but are not limited to enhancing authentication methods, deploying an endpoint detection and response tool in addition to our existing antivirus protection, decommissioning involved servers, streamlining user permissions, and of course continue to train our employees on recognizing and preventing cybersecurity threats. That is an ongoing task. And now I'll get to the frequently asked questions. I'm gonna go through the questions. Any of you or any of you have additional questions, uh, Ms. Sessions can assist in answering if I can't provide an answer. Can I get instructions on how to notify the IRS and request a PIN to prevent my child's social security number from being used on someone else's tax returns? This was one of the most asked questions from our parents because of tax season coming. We did provide them, uh, on those that called specifically, asked, informed them of how to go to the IRS website and request a PIN, because they can request a PIN to protect the identity. That PIN, they do have to request it every year. The only way that the IRS will provide a PIN on their own and send it directly to the individual is if they've already been an identified um, identity theft victim. I received a letter addressed to someone else. What should I do? If you received a letter addressed to someone else, please mark the letter as wrong address and place the letter in your mailbox so that the postal service will return to sender. Why was my address associated with this individual? The letters were sent to the last known address that, that the district had on file. If the district had no valid address on file, the addresses were identified through the National Change of Address database and other publicly available information. Why can't the district enroll me or my child in Experian's identity monitoring services? Experian must follow state and federal laws des designed to protect the privacy and security of your or your child's information. Before Experian can enroll you in the service, it needs to verify your identity. In the case of a minor, Experian needs to verify a parent or legal guardian that agrees to allow Experian to monitor the identity of a minor. I am having issues with Experian activation code received. And it, you know, it's a general, please contact Experian's customer care team at the phone number. They will be able to assist you with any issues if you have with your activation code. But we're also providing um, assistance to each individual as a you know, case by case basis. My child just turned 18 and received a minority identity, a minor identity my monitoring code. How do I activate his services? Please call the district offices 
at 956-361-6160 for assistance, and I'll be able to um, provide the assistance that that's required. What happens after the free one year of identity monitoring services is over? You will not be charged automatically after you com your complimentary credit and identity monitoring services expire. You may elect to extend the membership at your own expense. On some of the, the individuals, the parents that have been calling me, I have been providing them lists of resources that they can use for free. And there's also credit monitoring that's provided by their banks, different banks, credit cards if they have any. Um, Experian themselves provides basic monitoring services as well. I'm not sure they do it for the minors, but I know that they do for adults. I think someone stole my or my child's identity. What should I do? If you believe you or your child has been the victim of identity theft or have a reason to believe you or your child's information has been mis misused, you may call Experience Customer t Team at 877-288-8057 to take advantage of the identity restoration services being offered at no cost to you. Identity restoration specialists are immediately available to help you address credit and non-credit related fraud. What happens if my or my child's identity is stolen after the free one year membership, membership expires? If you activated your services, you may still call Experience Customer Care Team at 877-288-8057 to take advantage of services available through Identity Works Extend Care. Extend Care um, provides the same high level of identity restoration support even after your Experian Identity Works membership has expired. And the last slide, I have the phone numbers that we've provided in both the letters, the district office number, and experience support number to all of our, of the individuals. Ms. Pena, if you could go back to the prior slide when you're talking about Extend Care, please. That I would just like, I would like the community to understand and, and the board to understand that um, if an individual signs up for the credit monitoring through Experian, the credit monitoring ends after a year. That's the free credit monitoring. However, Extend Care does last for up to five years after that. So we would really encourage those who've received letters to sign up for the credit monitoring because they'll still be able to avail themselves to the services under Extend Care. So I just wanted to point that out, that that really applies to all three of the questions that you have here, that the Extend Care can be very helpful, and it's something that's available for those that sign up for the credit monitoring. Thank you. Ms. Pena, I have a, a, a couple of comments, if not questions. First and foremost, I, I believe that an email was sent out, to, especially to our staff, in reference to if they have any questions about, I mean, it's human nature, you know, your, your, the possibility of, of your identity theft, theft happening and, and your, uh, your data, you know, being out there anywhere and the, you know, uh, so people worry. And uh, one of the things that I've noted is although, and, and maybe it's because it's not common knowledge or it's not, it, the, the, the message hasn't been clear enough that if there's any questions related to this breach for San Diego CISD, your best answer is going to be through your department. And, and I, I say it, uh, I, I say this uh, with all due respect, but because I hear it within my family. You know, they talk among each other and what if and what this and what, you know, these questions need to be, I feel need to be addressed to your office so that they can get the best answer possible. Now, the other thing that, that this is, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and ask the question, but it, it's, I'm hoping that Lynn uh, can answer this for me. I think the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, issues here is uh, are people getting, uh, the biggest question is people getting correspondence that doesn't pertain to them. And one of the things that I noticed that, that you mentioned in the previous slide was that these letters were mailed to the last known address, okay? Now, if an individual has moved or moved several times, then if they don't have a last known address, then uh, these letters were issued out by a national change of address database. I would like, if, if at all possible, can you all give a better explanation to our members here today and to our audience that may be listening at home what this national change of address database entails and, and how they are able to uh, get those addresses and, and have letters sent out all over the state of Texas, if not other out of state, 
you know, because this is causing a panic, and I'd like for our community to understand where this or how this uh, database works. Sure. So the way the National Change of Address um, database works, um, we work with a, a notification vendor who mails out the letters to the affected individuals that alleviates the district from having to uh, type up the letters and mail them out and address them to you know, the 21,000 folks who were receiving letters. So as part of that service, what um, the company does is they will run all of the names and individuals through names of individuals with the addresses that the district had, because that's all we had to go on, um, through the National Change of Address database. What that is, is for those of you who have ever moved and you want your mail forwarded to your new address, the company goes back and looks at the National Change of Address database for up to four years to see if there have been any changes of addresses that have been registered with the post office and then they send it to the most current address. It's very similar to what happens, you know, anytime you, you move to a new location and your mail gets forwarded to you. So there's a way that the, um, that mail, that companies who, who are in the business of mailing items, that they can check the national change of address mail, uh, database and determine what the, mo the most current address is for an individual, assuming that they've, um, provided that new address to the post office. So Lynn, am I correct then to, uh, to assume based on what you're saying that, that uh, this national change of address database was basically a service that our district uh, engaged with to make the process of informing uh, victims, for lack of better words, uh, in a timely manner? So th these letters that went out were, went out on behalf of the district. It what doesn't necessarily state or doesn't necessarily mean that the district is the one responsible for mailing out the 21,000 letters themselves. They, they utilize this service uh, to help out. Is that correct? That's, exa that's exactly correct. So utilizing the service to get the, um, the, the mailing of the letters out in a timely manner an efficient manner, provide a call center service available to folks to call in and ask questions in addition to what you described as available at the district itself. And, um, and so, yes, as part of that service of mailing, they do a national change of address search to best ensure that the individuals who are supposed to receive letters receive letters at the, the most current address. So one final comment for me is at, at the very least, and I know it's time consuming, but I think it, it's going to be, uh, it's, it, it'll be beneficial to our district. This information that you're providing for us right now uh, in English, uh, especially the part about this database uh, service that we utilize to mail out those announcements or those letters uh, that we somehow, some way uh, provide uh, a Spanish version or a Spanish explanation to our uh, community members uh, that, that are uh, Spanish speakers so that they also understand, you know, again, it's human nature. I understand that, that, that people are going to, you know, panic. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that, that many of our community members did panic and rightfully so. But if we, prov we shoot out that correct information to our community, both in English and Spanish, that might help uh, alleviate some of the panic. Will do. I wanna We're happy to work with the district. I want, I want to thank you all for all the job that you've done on this issue. This is a great issue. So I have a question. My question is, how far of years of service from the district do you get the, the letter? 20 years, 10 years, 15 years? How far back? I can't provide that, yes. the answer. Yes. Bless you. Thank you. Ms. Yeah, I I don't think we know how far back the data, okay. are you asking how far back the data okay. goes that affected um, employees may have been included in this? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I got a letter. I, I, got, I, got, I, got, I, got, I got a letter under other, other, other person's name. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, that, but, okay. okay. Um, I have a couple comments to make on this. So I do want to um, voice my appreciation for using the National Change of Address Database. Um, we have a deceased relative who was working for the district who got the letter to the correct place that it needed to go after. So that was extremely thankful to y'all for doing that. Um, second thing 
is I'm gonna request to see if there's some kind, I, this is a great presentation, this is very informative, but this is more of to us, and which I appreciate, but I was wondering if there's any way that we can do a town hall and maybe get anybody who has any questions in a larger format, that way they can voice the concerns that they have and ask any questions. I know you have the call center, I know you have that available, but just something a bit informal, just a town hall, get everybody that has any questions. That way, these people that have legitimate concerns, they get their concerns heard. Second thing is if we can get out some word stating that if there is an individual who feels that they may have been affected and they didn't get a letter because they did change address and did not go through that process, if they can reach out to see if their name did pop up and they can get the letter sent to the correct place, if we can get that in English and Spanish, I think that would be extremely helpful for the community as well. Well, the last part we did send out, mm -hmm. that if you thought you were a victim and you did not receive a letter uh, to notify us, we could put it on a grander scale, I suppose, but uh, we put it on Facebook, we put it, we send it to every uh, employee as well. Uh, another thing is that there are certain things that we can and cannot do, and I think that that's something that we could discuss later on because of um, the parameters of a cyber attack. And um, I know that we've been working really closely with Lynn and with Allison um, on what we will be able to discuss and not discuss. So I don't know, Lynn, did you want to add something to the open forum concept or anything like that as far as, I know Ms. Pena has been handling every call meticulously. She's been leaving at nine o'clock at, at night after me, after Dr. McGee, Ms. Dr. McGee used to be the last one. So she makes sure she returns as many calls as she can. I know that we have a large decrease. There was, you know, initially there was a large amount. Now they've decreased, uh, but that's the way we've been handling it individually. She's mm -hmm. taken her time with them. She's met with them in person. Uh, and she's even gone above and beyond to problem solve for them. So. So Ms. Lee, maybe, oh. so maybe she can answer all her questions, mm -hmm. you know, once we're done. But I have a question for you because, um, of course, it, it affected my family, my son. Is your mic on my screen? Yeah, it's on. So it, it affected my family as, as, as well. So, uh, you know, it's, it's an extremely sensitive situation. We all know that. And, you know, uh, especially at the scale that it is right now and the way everyone found out. You know, it's unfortunate. Um, uh, but I commend you guys for doing what you guys did in a timely manner. But I think what we need is a timeline. I think this needs to be extremely uh, simplistic as far as when exactly this, this whole breach started. Mm -hmm. Was it in November? Was it, in, you know, in, in, because I'm telling you right now what's happening is that people are calling this number and they're telling them that the, the, their information has been on the dark web, whatever, for six months now. So, so for us to wait and then send out these letters, you know, to notify our, our, our you know, our, our parents and to notify our staff, you know, on the 59th day or whatever it is that's been coming out because we have 60 days to notify because they came on November 1st. But, they're, you know, I think, I think all that needs to be answered. You know, all that information... I think needs to be clarified as a timeline, you know, like we provide timelines for everything else so that people can understand, you know, the dynamics of, of how impactful it was, how big it is, you know, what other, what other school districts do. Do they send out a blanket statement and say, hey, listen, we, for, you know, just for your information, you know, we did, there was a breach. We don't have all the information yet, but we're going to do an investigation, at least to calm them down just a little bit. Not, I mean, because from my understanding is some people are got, already got affected by the time they got their letters, you know, so now, with, now I feel like, honestly, I feel like we're, we're going backwards. So to, you know. to add to what you're saying, I understand your request and your concern. And, and yes, you're right, some parents did get affected and actually some employees even um, that reached out to me. And a lot of those were actually situations where they were affected prior to the incident. 2017, 2018, some even earlier than that. And because of the notification that we sent, they were able to find out about those and use these services for that. But uh, yes, I, I do understand and I see where you're coming from, something that Ms. Arion can, can, we can discuss along with um, Ms. Sessions as far yeah, as all, providing all asking, a different asking, timeline. Exactly, all I'm asking for is when the breach happened. You know, I, I, but so, did it happen November the 1st and you guys got notified? Did it happen you so know, six months the earlier? District, when exactly did it the get district notified? found out on November 1st but according to the investigation, we found out that the cyber criminals did access the network between April 8th and October 10th. Okay, thank you. 
So what's important to note is that on November 1st, we did not notify on the 59th day. That's very important because on November 1st, if you're gonna to go to November 1st, when we found out from Region 1, because TEA called Region 1, and then they notified us, on November 1st when we found out, we didn't know that there was sensitive, personal, identifiable information. We didn't know. So there has to be an investigation. That investigation entails a lot. So if you can see that on our Q&A or our FAQs, and it was on your slideshow presentation as well, that after the investigation, and I don't know, Lynn, you stop me if you think you need to. On the investigation, it tells you that we go back and we know that they were possibly getting our information on April 8th through October 2nd. The district did not know. The district did not know, so we could not act, we could not identify. We found that on November 1st, but even then, we still didn't know what kind of information was on there. So it's important to note that on November 1st, we start with our cyber response team so that we can go in and start peeling back the layers of what's going on, because at that point, there is no information. There is no specific, Teresa Servillon's social security number is, was exposed. Exactly, but Ms. Servillon, but to my point, you know, we need a timeline. You know, if, you got, if it happened in April, and then you know you got notified in November. Okay, then you guys got your, your investigative services. When did they start? Did they start on November first? The they started exactly on November first. Okay. Yes, we went into. We engaged them okay. the day that we were notified. So, okay, so so, I, so, 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 wanna, so just that, that's exactly my point. You know, I'm not here to argue because I don't know. This is the first time we're getting this information. All I'm saying is that you know, so everybody can be have a little bit of peace of mind because I know this is very stressful for everyone. Like Mr. Moreno said, you know, and everybody's just rambling around trying to figure out what's going on. So I just feel as, as somebody that, you know, that us that represent the district, I think we need to do a job to make sure that we're very sensitive to the situation and continue to, to provide them the information so they can be at ease. You know, Lynn, after the did fact. you want to add something? Yeah, I was just going to say you asked what other school districts do, and I get the good fortune of getting to work with school districts all over the state of Texas. And, um, and one of the things that We've had a few districts that have gone out, um, I'll say prematurely, but have gone out on the front end. And what we've learned is that without having answers to questions like specifically who's affected, um, what type of information is impacted by an incident, and having resources like the Experian resources that San Benito um, provided to the affected individuals here, that it actually creates panic in a different way than what we're dealing with right, right now. So the panic on the front end, I know there is a real desire for our school districts to want to be very transparent and open with their communities um, and with their employees, but in not having resources available and not knowing whether an individual is actually affected by something, it creates a completely different type of scenario. And we would probably be having this type of meeting with those same types of concerns without having the answers that Ms. Pena has been able to provide to you. So when, you know, I will tell you, it's our advice to, uh, to, to tell districts and, and frankly other companies and other edu educational institutions to know what's affected because then you at least know who the population is that you're talking to and it frankly needs to be concerned about things versus the entire community who, who might have had the same concerns without us having the answers to these questions. And that's why the law allows you to do an investigation. It provides you that time to do the investigation and be compliant with Texas law so that you can be very thoughtful about who it is that is being notified and how it is that you're providing them services. So, Ms. Pena, you, you made a comment a little while ago where you mentioned that uh, once these letters were mailed out to the community, Okay, uh, not only did it, be, did it create an awareness as to what was going on, but <clears throat> based on um, community members receiving those letters, am I correct to, do, did I hear correctly that, that their personal information and or data may have been compromised way prior to this data breach, having nothing to do with correct. this data breach? So yes. it just brought it out like, he hello? I mean, like you said, 2016, 2017, whatever yes. those years, I mean, so having nothing to do with, with the this. data breach that we're currently experiencing. Yes, and I, okay. and I can right, but bring the parents in if you would like. No, that, that's exactly my point, you know. Mm -hmm. You want to hone in, it could have been, okay, because they're, they're, they're calling and they're, that's what they're telling them. So whether it was prior or not or yes or no, it's, it's not for us to decide. 
what it is to say, the process to make sure that you know they, we mitigate the, the, the continuous issues that are gonna occur because of this. So all we're doing is just trying to, to appease the parents any way we can after the fact you know, and, and to see what we can do to, to, to make sure they got the information they need. I'm I not think. appeasing parents after the fact. It's, it's factual. The information is on the report. The date, yes. okay. the, the information that they used, if, it, if, a, if the social security number is being used by another name, okay. it actually states it on there. Okay, good. So they'll find out with this whole process yes. that it was so prior, prior, so prior, it's prior, prior to November. Yeah. yeah. I think it's important to note, though, Mr. Lopez, as well. I, I hear what you're saying, but it's important to note. You mentioned mitigate and try to get to the bottom of this, but you can't. Our district can't mitigate something that they don't know. So you know now because of these letters, you know that we're finding out, or they're finding out that their that data was compromised prior to this breach for whatever reason, you know, we can't act on something we don't know. No, yeah, I understand that, Mr. Wadden, but I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. All I'm saying is that, because we don't know that. Right. All I'm saying is that when, when, when this breach occurred, okay, we found out in November and we acted. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we did what we did with the investigation. That's why I'm asking for a timeline. Correct. But see, I don't even know. Okay, so, you know, that's what I'm saying. So, could it have affected it? Absolutely. Could it have been a prior? Of course. Yes. You know, so we can't, we, that's not what I'm, that, that's not my, 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 my whole conversation here, my debate. All, my, all, I'm, all I'm saying is that, you know, all, all I'm saying is that to have a timeline of when it got breached, when the information started going to all these websites, okay, and find out exactly when potentially it could have gotten affected. And that, like, apparently what you're saying is the investigation is going to tell, or tell us or tell them that, yeah, it did get affected or it was some other issue prior, somebody it, else. Yes. Exactly. It will, it will state the okay, date. Okay, thank you. That, that's, that's all I want to know. Thank okay. you so much. Appreciate it. So that's, I think that's really important to note that on Experian, as you go in there, your whole credit record is on there. So that would be going back, you know, like she's saying to 2019, 2015, 2012. People have called parents, staff that have said, I didn't even know that this was already going on. So this is what the service has assisted with if you want to look for a kind of silver lining. Uh, when it comes to uh, the, the, I guess, data mining and the data dig, that was a very cumbersome process, which, by the way, uh, Lynn and Allison have given much kudos to our technology uh, department spearheaded right now by, by Ms. Peña in the time that they did it in and the amount of work they completed. And so um, it's unfortunate that this happened. Uh, it is something that uh, you have to think is preempted, like you said, for years before. And so uh, this is a cyber criminal attack, and that's really the bottom line. Yes, it's all, it goes on throughout the United States, through school systems, through businesses. You hear T-Mobile had an attack. You hear Wells Fargo. You hear Chase, Bank of America. And there's several major school districts like Houston ISD, Dallas ISD that have had this kind of attack. So um, at this point, we're remediating. We're doing uh, what we can. We wanted to make sure we offered the services to our community, to our students. And as you can see, it can go on for five more years where you can go ahead and have this service. Mrs. Uh, Peña has gone above and beyond to find free services where you can also monitor your credit and also have some sort of identity protection. And I want to commend you because you have really been going above and beyond. You have been. Yeah, I mean, I'm, and and I'm so, not here to receive, you know, it's, it, that's you our job. It's our job and that's what we're here for. And we went to lunch today and then she paid for me. So I'm like, why are you paying for me? I should be paying for you. So uh, again, discussing the situation and making sure we got all the information out. So um, again, it's unfortunate that it did happen in this manner. And like they said, it was you know years in the making, years before of data. And I don't know, Lynn, if you can add something else that has to do, we, we did everything I think that was recommended that has been research-based and that has shown to be the most effective so that we could ensure that we could keep a hold of our system and not lose it completely as others have. You're 100% spot on, and we do, you know, as you mentioned, large, well-funded Fortune 500 companies are being impacted by this. The federal government um, has to deal with these types of attacks as well, 
Um, you may have heard a few years ago, Colonial Pipeline shut down the whole, whole East Coast from it. Uh, and this is an oil and gas company that have a lot of resources at their disposal to be able to try to prevent this. And, um, you know, what we saw the district do here is not only respond very quickly once they learned of the incident, but thoroughly and thoughtfully um, with, with the community and with the students in particular in mind. Uh, and in response to the incident after the investigation, putting forth uh, remediation and corrective action to help prevent something like this from happening again in the future, which Ms. Pena laid out on the slides for all of you, that's gonna be the key, right? Is what are we gonna do to help, help prevent something like this from happening in the future? And due to the, the diligence and the thoughtfulness around this, we see some school districts that just do not respond the way that, that San Benito did. Um, and I just wanna kind of put that into perspective that, um, you know, that this was a, a good response, a timely response, no matter how quickly we, do, we go out, uh, we always have folks saying, why couldn't you have gone out faster? If I go out an hour, they want it out a half hour faster than that. So that's just the nature of, um, I think, human nature and wanting to hear something as quickly as possible. Um, having said that, uh, I think one of the things we often will tell clients, you're in a better security state following an instant, incident like this than you are certainly prior to it because of the, the remediation and corrective action that gets taken. Ms. Servion, if I can weigh in for just a minute. Um, I just wanted to echo some of the things that have been said and relay some of my observations as the process has gone on. And I want to thank uh, Ms. Servion, I want to thank Ms. Pena, I want to thank all the staff members uh, that I've seen and the response that I've seen and the seriousness that everybody has uh, uh, taken and, and how much of a priority this has been. Um, and also thank uh, uh, Allison and Lynn of Baker Hostetler have helped and all their team. And um, you know, most importantly to the community, uh, it's important for the, for the community to understand that its school district is doing everything it could. And, and that has certainly been what's occurred. Um, the district has taken every step available to it. Uh, it had a team of consultants and investigators and attorneys assembled uh, right away. The meetings began right away. The process of assessing the situation began uh, immediately. And the district has listened carefully to the advice of its consultants and its attorneys and has followed those experts, uh, counsel every step of the way. And has dealt with this as well as it could have. Uh, in, in, in based upon what I've seen. So I just want to echo that and thank everyone involved. And by no means is this the end of the road. The district is going to continue to, to address this and respond to, to, to concerns from folks or, or reports in relationship to it. But um, I just want to communicate that and communicate my observations and thank everyone. Ms. Thank you. I, yeah, I I'm one, gonna... one last question, Mr. Uh, Real quick, is this it? I mean, it does what we've rolled out already in, during this investigation, the amount of, inf of information or, or individuals that were affected, is this it or could there be more that you guys don't know of yet? Or no, this is the, we This went, is total? Yes, we we're went not, We're not gonna get surprised in a month or two that there's more, there's there's not any of that going on? Okay. No. Okay, thank you. You know, I'm, I'm gonna apologize beforehand for, I might get a little testy here, but, there are some things that we as a school district, we as a board member sitting here, we need to be held accountable for. And this is one of the things. We need to say our apologies and we need to let the community know that we are doing what's in the best interest, all the steps that we're taking and everything that's been done. And y'all have done that and I appreciate that. But to try and sugarcoat this with, oh, it could have happened in the past, it could have been something like that, like that just really gets my blood boiling and my heart racing. Because if my, Identity is taken from T-Mobile, if it's taken from my Ulta credit card, if it's taken from anywhere, I want to be informed. And the fact that this is a school district, this is our community, and these are our community members, trying to sugarcoat that is not sitting well with me, and I know it's not sitting well with a lot of people. I want them to know that we're doing what's done, and I want them to know that we are doing our best as a school district to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And I know I mentioned the open forum earlier, and we were going to ask Lynn about it and to see what her best judgment, what her recommendation would be, and I would really want to know the answer to that because 
I want all of our community members to know that we are sorry that this happened, we have made our apologies, we have put things into place, and we are doing what needs to be done for our community. So I will, I will say this in, rel in response to the question about an open forum. Um, in general, I don't have a problem with the open forum, but there are, does need to be some parameters around it because there is some sensitive, I don't even mean the sense of personal information, but I mean sensitivities around the security of the district systems that we don't want to put um, that data at further risk, right? Uh, and I know that's not specifically the types of questions that you're wanting to be addressed. Having said that, um, I would like there to be a little more time for individuals to avail themselves to calling the call center, uh, going, talking to the district directly. And if we do still feel like, I would say probably by the end of the month, that a town hall is still warranted, then I think that's absolute, that would be absolutely appropriate to do that. Um, again, with parameters that we're not going to be asking about how did the, how did the hacker get in, other things that, that could put the, the, the district at risk. Um, so I, I'm not sure what how you react to that, but that would be my recommendation because you know initially we're we're ten days into this since the letters actually started mailing, uh, so probably you know I guess kind of ten days into the new year if you will, and so it sounds to me like resources are being made available to the community. The community is taking uh, taking um, uh, advantage of those services and or talking with district staff to help get their questions, answers, or assistance uh, through credit monitoring or other questions that they may have about the incident itself. So I do have a question for Ms. Cruz or Dr. Cruz. What, if, what are we sugarcoating? There is nothing being sugarcoated, I feel. You I feel that we've been very forward with our information and what we can say and what we no, can No, no, I, I, that's fine. I was okay until you and Mr. Moreno started talking about, well, your data could have been breached set in 2017 and it, 2015. I understand that could have been a possibility, a very real possibility, but the fact is we had an incident that needs to be known and Can you try. let Mr. Avion talk real quick? Go, go ahead, Mr. Avion. No, well, that is, everything that we've given you is factual. And we're not, it's not that we're not taking ownership. That's not what's going on here. What's going on here is that we followed a process, a very deliberate process, and a very delineated process. And so uh, the fact that it's being uh, said that we were not transparent or we were trying to hold back information, that is not accurate. The one comment that I made right now was in response to the fact that you said, well, your data could have been breached 10 years ago. Yes, it could have been breached 10 years ago, but it very well could have resulted from this incident. So that feels to me like we're trying to be like, oh, well, you know, so this is I, a good thing that me? happened. Yes, because I, I and, you, and you may learn, but, but uh, we're not trying to sugarcoat. I stated a fact. I stated a fact that was made, that, that we were made aware of, that this could have, and we're not, we're not by any means negating the fact that 21,000 plus uh, of our community members and or students were involved. But, and, and that, that, that is definitely not in, in an attempt to sugarcoat anything. We're just saying that in addition to that 21,000, a fact was stated that some of our constituents, some of our committees, some of our former teachers may have been compromised prior to this breach. We're not trying to say that this was not, uh, th that this is not a serious matter. It is a serious matter. But by the same token, you are entitled to your opinion, ma'am, and you said it respectfully. And, that is, and that's the way you feel. You feel it was sugarcoated. So, you know, I, I respect that, but that's not, that was not my intent. And, and again, I was reiterating a fact that was shared to us publicly. I agree with you, Mr. Moreno. We're not sugarcoating anything, Dr. Cruz. We're not, we just, we, we know the facts. We know that it's been in the past. So we're addressing that situation. It's a, it's a serious situation. And I know you're upset, but we're not sugarcoating anything. I, I just think, you know, my last comment, you know, I'm not, I'm not argue this point again. I mean, it's very really obvious. You know, uh, it's what's what's done is done. But I think what we need to do is once again for everyone is a timeline. Okay, when it happened, when we when we activated the investigation, you know, um, as far as how their information is already out in the web, you know, people need to know that information. You know, we I mean, you know, we're sitting here and, and, and we're debating all this you know conversation back and forth, and in reality, you know, um, we need to be very sympathetic with the fact is that there was a major issue. You know, and 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 instead of you know uh, talking about 
you know, X, Y, and Z, well, we need to talk about, okay, you know what? Yes, it happened. Now what are we going to do to solve it? And what are we going to do to mitigate any more issues? And, and that, I think, will be resolved. Don't we with, already with have the, a timeline? Don't we already with, with have the, a timeline? With, I'm, I'm talking. Yeah, the first I'm, I'm talking. Slides. Oh, okay. okay I'm just, I'm just, do we no. have a timeline? Yeah. No, but I'm talking. Oh, no, you're, okay. you're, you're missing my point, baby. Let me finish. Okay. Um, all, all I'm asking for is from when the breach started to where we're at right now. That's all I'm asking for. It's a timeline so everyone knows, employees knows, our community knows. Right now, we don't know. All we know, there was a letter sent out. You were notified on November. The district was notified November the first. But when did the breach actually happen? Because they're calling these numbers and they're telling them that you, their information. The do you want to put the slide before. back up, Lee? There. Yes, because the, it's on the slide. The, the thing is you want to get granular, Mr. Lopez, and it's never going to be granular. It's never going to be that we're going to be able to pinpoint exactly when somebody's data was taken. That's not the way this works. Mr. Rion, I'm not here to debate you. Okay? I, I'm not all, debating. All I'm, all I'm, I'm just saying, saying you want to get granular. It's not going to work that way. It's, it's not granular. All I'm asking and all I'm asking you is to find, to you put a timeline of when exactly it happened. There's a you said, so, there's a You're saying it happened, happened, you know, there's the time April the 8th. That's the, exactly when it the happened. The cyber criminals intermittently accessed our network between April 8th okay. and October 10th. Okay. That's when they accessed our network. So they accessed it twice? No. Intermittently. In oh, intermittent. Intermit okay. So, so they, okay, they come pieces. in and out. And okay. did we know? No. No, we didn't know until November right. the 1st. We, oh, yes. we found out by TEA notifying okay. us. And I want, to, I want to say something, and maybe, uh, Lynn, correct me if I'm wrong. Just the, because we sent out letters notifying the individuals that were identified does not mean that they are identity theft victims already. Right. The, the reason why we sent out the letters was to make them aware of what happened so that they could sign up for the protection, monitor their credit, yeah. or end their information because it monitors how their social security number is being used. I understand that. Okay. That's what the letter was for. And so if they are identity victim, because of this situation, there are identity restoration services provided, and there's also um, insurance. Okay, One million dollars. So, right. So, so I guess the people that got it don't know about this because they're calling. They're finding out that this was taken exactly on this time. You see, mm -hmm. so the people so, on the community don't understand or don't know when exactly this happened. So that's why I'm saying it could have it could have happened at a time in between. Yes. Five or six months prior. Let, That's all I'm saying. Let me make a comment. Let me make a comment about the past identity theft that I think will help address Mr. Lopez and um, and Ms. Uh, Dr. Cruz's question. So one of the things that we do find out is when whenever you any person signs up for identity monitoring or, or credit monitoring, oftentimes they will find out that they were a victim of a prior data breach that involved data having nothing to do with this particular incident. That is very very common that that happens. And what this service does allow for is to clean up that, that concern. So even if it has zero relation to this particular incident, they're able to use those experience services to help clean up any issue that they've had, even if they don't know anything about it. So, uh, Mr. Lopez, I think that, um, you know, the concern here is that this incident happened to San Benito. It appears to have at least the first time of access was April of, this year, of, last, of 2022. Um, an intermittent access until October of 2022, but any identity theft that an individual may find on their credit history prior to that had nothing to do with this particular incident. But they are finding out about it if they are signing up for the service, and they're able to get that cleaned up, which, you know, I, I hesitate to say that, that, I mean, it is a silver lining because they're able to, to clean that up, um, but they wouldn't have otherwise known about it had they not signed up for these services. So we would really want to encourage the folks who are receiving these letters to be able to sign up for these services because either they can, they're either going to see if there is, one of the things it does for us is if we see a large group of people that have recent identity theft and it gets reported back to us, then we're able to attribute it to this particular incident. Otherwise, it can be attributed to a million other different incidents, frankly, that we are helping other clients out on um, and that you all have probably received letters on before as well. So, okay. I heard the T-Mobile okay. incident, I heard Wells Fargo, et cetera. Yeah, but it, 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 it identifies what it was prior before where it was at because of this. Right. Okay. Correct. All right, man. Well, thank I you. have a question, Ms. Pena. I have a question. Yes, sir. How many people have actually signed up for the service? I wouldn't have that answer because I don't have access know? like to a portal, but... Oh. No, so we have to specifically ask Experian that question, and okay. we will. We tend to allow for a little bit of time to sign up, um, but we would we can find that out on a kind of every couple of weeks basis or every month basis to get a sense of how many people have signed up. 
I think that'd be a good idea that we find out what those numbers are. Thank you. I, I agree, and, and hopefully we can do it in Spanish for those that speak Spanish here, here in, the, in San Benito. Do what? Are you talking about for Experian? We translated everything. Okay, okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Thanks to Ms. Gonzalez, all the FAQs, uh, all the letters, everything was done through the, through the district and was also given to the call center so that they could answer the questions in Spanish. Mr. Leon, can you, is it going to continue to, is this, this company going to continue to promote for the, for, the, for the people that haven't signed up to continue to sign up? Yes, okay. we'll continue to send out, uh, well, we won't send out notices, but we'll, re but, we'll send yeah. out reminders. And, and they'll let us know how many people signed up, or that's yes. almost impossible? Um, they said we could get can a report, right, okay. Lynn? Awesome. Okay, we good. We can get a report. Thank you, okay, Lynn. Good. Okay, good. Ms. Servion, one other thing I was going to note is, just to clarify, um, <laughs> uh, and you mentioned this earlier, but this, this bears repeating, is the district did not send out these letters on the 59th day. That is not what occurred. The district has to be able to identify who is involved. You have to know who to send the letters to. You have to know legally the process is the district has to be able to assess who is involved and equally important who was not involved so that you can accurately tell those folks that they need to take advantage of services. Um, Sending out a generalized notice does not give that information to any of those folks. Does not tell somebody who may have been involved, I need to take steps. Does not tell somebody who was not involved. It doesn't give spe specific information. That's why the process under Texas law is that you assess who is involved. Once you know who that is, that is when your time to disclose begins, is my understanding of the law. So. You know, in actuality, the district in sending the letters out on December the 30th, uh, my understanding was well in advance of the 60th day. Uh, it was not up against it. It was well in advance of it. There were questions that arose about whether uh, November the 1st was the start date. And I'll represent to you that the district decided internally that they were just going to get it done by the 60th date from November the 1st, because they felt like that would give the community more comfort and just did it uh, within that 60 day period, even though that's not when it was due. Ms. So I want I just want to clarify that to everybody. That's that is what occurred. Miss Benyard, do you have the date that everybody was identified? December six, December 16th, the, the day that we went on break. Actually, we turned in the file a little bit before midnight that day. So the investigation, so, we can say, lasted from about November 1st to December 16th. No, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. That's also on the slide. And be compliant. I'm sorry, Ms. Sarayon. No, that was on the slide as well. Mm -hmm. Did you have something to add? I was just going to just kind of drive the point home uh, that Mr. Weller was saying that, that um, under Texas law, the district actually had until February 14th to send out the notification letters. Um, because the identification uh, and investigation concluded on December the 16th. So if we look at 60 days from that, we have till mid-February, so you can tell they were, the district was very much on top of this, getting it out just a few weeks later. Are we going to be able to post the slideshow presentation on the I believe, board yes. agenda? Okay. We will post it and we will send it to each employee as well. Sounds good. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Allison. And thank you for all your help and your continued support. The district appreciates it. Thank you in the community. Thank you, ma'am. Bye-bye. Aye. Item 2.3, review and discussion of the memorandum of understanding between San Diego CIZ and Texas State Technical College dual enrollment program for the 2023-2024 school year. Instead of you. Uh, yes, sir. So we have Mr. Rosa here waiting patiently <laughs> to uh, come forth and give us some information. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, President uh, Moreno, members of the board, Superintendent Cerrillon. Uh, just uh, getting ahead of the game here, uh, you know how universities uh, work with, and they're trying to get their schedule getting ready for the fall to 2023. So here's our preliminary MOU for our uh, dual enrollment courses through TSTC. 
Uh, I'm currently working with them to try to increase the number of dual enrollment. Uh, we're also looking at possibility of having some uh, web-based uh, dual enrollment through CTE as well. Uh, this one also covers our education dual enrollment, which Ms. De La Fuente teaches currently. Uh, so we're trying to get ahead uh, at this point in time. And they usually run about six months ahead so they can start putting out their summer schedule and their fall schedule as well. So this is part of that MOU with uh, TSTC. Any questions, board members? Agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Mr. You, Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, committee concerns? Any committee concerns? Okay. Okay. Meeting is adjourned at um, 7.10 p.m.